Well, hey, y'all can be seated. It's so good to be here this morning, and uh, man, when Pastor Dan asked me to be here, I was so honored and thrilled. Me and my wife were just here visiting uh, just at the end of June, and uh, we had such a great time, and we just came out here to refresh, and I remember this was our last stop on the way home, and I'm telling you, you guys have a very special place here. I love it. I love it. And we talked about it almost the entire way home. In fact, we're like, man, how can we do this at our church? You know, how can we make an atmosphere like that? And uh, you guys have such a special place. But really, it's all because of Pastor Dan, Pastor Leslie's vision for this house. And I'm telling you, you have some incredible leaders here. And I love Pastor Dan. I love Pastor Leslie. And I'm just telling you, we, we had dinner the other night and Pastor Dan is more than just a pastor to you. He's a pastor to me. And because there's a lot of stuff, we're in a very similar season at our church there in Murfreesboro where uh, our church looks a lot like yours. But Pastor Dan has a lot of wisdom when it comes to, hey, how do you handle this? How, how, do, you, how do you move forward from this? And especially in the time that we're in, uh, that we find our world in, uh, it's just incredible to have a friend and to have a pastor. Every pastor needs a pastor and Pastor Dan is one of my pastors, and so I'm just so thrilled. You guys have such a great leader here. In fact, can we just give, give it up for Dan and Leslie and thank them? I know as a pastor, you, you really don't hear it enough, and so thank you, thank you, thank you. You're leading an incredible church that's going to change a lot of lives, and uh, we really do believe that. And I'm here today with my wife, Emily, and uh, my, in fact, my entire family joined us. Uh, we said, hey, we're going to Tulsa, and they said, we want to be in on it. Uh, and so they're with us today, and you might say, well, well, that's, that's kind of crazy. Well, let me tell you, we're, we're from a really small town, Murfreesboro, Illinois. It's southern Illinois, and uh, to give you an idea... We were just excited to come out here. We like to eat everybody. We, we like to shop. And uh, to give you a little idea of where we're from, we just got a, our first ever standalone Starbucks. So that's the type of town... <laughs> That's the type of town we live in, everybody, and so uh, it's a big deal when you don't have to walk in a grocery store or Target to get Starbucks. You can drive through. It's amazing, everybody. Uh, so, so we're out here, and we're joy enjoying all the luxury that you guys have. You might not realize it, but uh, a drive through Starbucks is a luxury, and uh, you guys got many of them. So... <laughs> So they're all out with us, with me today, and uh, I'm just excited that they're here. And uh, today, uh, I just wanted to bring you a simple message. Something that I really like to do at our church is just doing a character study, where we just take one Bible character, we really own in on it, and uh, we say, well, what if that Bible character was here with us today, what would they say? What would they encourage us with? And so today... I'm going to talk about my favorite Bible character, that the Bible character I'm named after, Noah. And so uh, I know that might sound a little confusing because we just met, and, uh, but hey, I'm going to talk about Noah today. And uh, in fact, one of my friends said, um, he, he was texting me, he said, I think it's so interesting that uh, you're Noah talking about Noah at a place called Noah's. And so... <laughs> He said, that might be a little confusing to guest preach, but hey, you do whatever the Lord leads you to do. So hope that doesn't confuse you. But like I said, one of my favorite things is to really just do a character study. I, I, I love to ask the question, man, if Noah was here today, what would he say? I think Noah would say a lot of different things. I think, honestly, uh, the story of Noah in Genesis is something that doesn't get talked about a lot. There's not a lot of messages out here on it. So I like to, I like to bring this story to light. And there's several different things that you can pull out of this story. One of them is you could just simply say, don't miss the boat, right? Like it's, it's going, it, it's, it's leaving, don't miss it. Um, it, it. Another big principle that you could pull out of this story is the fact that, man, just plan ahead. It's important to plan ahead. It took Noah 120 years to build this ark, and so there's a principle there. I don't know, maybe Noah would tell you something like the woodpeckers on the inside are worse than the storms on the outside, <laughs> you know? Like, watch out. Uh, I, I've also got some questions for Noah. I like, you ever, like, when you get to heaven, you just got some questions you just need to clear up. 
Well, one of the questions that I really have for Noah is, man, why didn't you just take care of those two mosquitoes? You know what I'm talking about, everybody? Like, like if you could have just took care of those two bugs, like, boom, it could have all been over. And, uh, but, you know, I, uh, that's the type of questions. But today, I, I want to help you understand the story to Noah. And what I love to do is I, I love to help people understand the Bible as it relates to history and a timeline. Because I think most people think, in fact, we have, being a new church, we have a lot of people who have just come to know Christ, and they have lots of questions about the Bible. And a lot of people think that the Bible is in chronological order. The Bible's not in chronological order. The Bible is grouped together by different types of books. There's the poetry section. There's the historical section. There's different sections to the Bible. In fact, the, the history of the Bible goes about 6,000 years deep. And there's 4,000 years before Christ. That's where we see Adam and Eve, 4,000 years before Christ. And so where does Noah fit in into this story? Well, Noah's about 10 generations from Adam and Eve. He's about 1,000 years later in about 3,000 B.C. And at this time, we see this earth where the earth really had a uniqueness to where most scholars believe it didn't need any rain. And so that's why we see at this point in the Bible, also there's people who are living hundreds and hundreds of years. Noah lived to be about 950 years old. He started having kids at 500 years old, everybody, to which some of you are like, that might not be like a bad idea. It sounds like a pretty good idea to me. And uh, <laughs> whatever it is, his kids, Shem, Ham, and Japheth all really don't work in our society. I guess maybe unless you're in Oklahoma. I mean, like Ham could be like a football player or something. I don't know. It might work out here. Whatever. It, he, Noah started to build the ark when he was 600 years old. I mean, I just can't imagine. And you say, well, Pastor Noah, well, what, what's that all about? It kind of sounds like the Bible's a fairy tale or something. Like, it doesn't seem like any of this is possible. Well, I just want to encourage you today that it's all very possible because without sin... Without sickness and disease on the earth, this is so early into scripture here, people's bodies just naturally lived a long time. In fact, Noah's grandfather was Methuselah. He was 969 years old when he passed away. And so uh, we see this, we see this idea that the earth didn't need any rain. It was fed through some natural springs. And personally, I believe that... Uh, that when God recreates the earth, he, he, I think he's going to put it back to that. I think when it says that there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, I personally believe there's not going to be any more rainy days, everybody. No more rainy days, no more Mondays. And uh, I, I also believe that the Krispy Kreme light is going to be on, hot and fresh, ready to go all the time. Like, that's, that's what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm excited for that. I, that's my heaven, everybody. But um, however you look at that. What we see is early on in this story of Noah that wickedness really begins to come into the earth in horrible, horrible ways. And this is where we pick up the story of Noah. He's in this condition where, honestly, the world is very messed up. Which, by the way, after the flood and after God judging the earth, that's where you really see the diminish of the lifespans of people after Noah in fact, in the next thousand years, you see that uh, the lifespans really come down to pretty much close to where it is today, where Moses lived to be about 120 years old. And you say, well, that sounds like a fairy tale. Do you really believe this, Noah? Me, Noah. And uh, I, I, I absolutely do. And uh, I have a literal belief in Scripture, and I want to teach it to you that way today. I just so happen to think that our God is bigger I think he knows so much more than I do. I think he knows so much more than any of us. And for us to say, well, if I can't fit that idea in my brain, then it's not true. I, I, I think that's a really sad stance because I, I've literally heard people talk about, man, I, if I don't understand it, then it must not be true. And when people do that, they're just reducing God down to the size of their own brain. And I'm telling you, that's not very smart. It's not, not the way to do it. In fact, one time I just, uh, before we get into the content here, I just wanted to share a, a story. I, I'd heard this story about uh, this boy named Johnny. Johnny, a, a young boy, he had a midterm paper due, and he wrote this paper on Jonah. Jonah and the big whale, the big fish, and the teacher, he turned in the paper, and, and the teacher looked at it, and the teacher was kind of aggravated. She said, well, well Johnny... 
don't you know that that's pretty impossible for that to happen? Like, there's no way that Jonah would have survived in the belly of that fish. It, it, there's no way it, it would have happened. And so Johnny said back to the teacher, Johnny said, well, you know what? When I get to heaven, I'll ask him. And the teacher said, well, well, what if Jonah's not in heaven? And Johnny said, well, then you ask him. <laughs> Ooh, some of y'all just now getting that. I, <laughs> now I'm not recommending that response. That's not what I'm preaching about today, but I thought that was pretty funny. So let's dive into the content. And uh, listen, if Noah had one chance to encourage you today, I, I think he'd say something like this. I think he'd say, this, is, this might be in your notes here. It says, for when you wonder if your life really counts, one person, a single person, you in this room, you can make a difference. For those who, I want to speak really today for those of you who you don't think that your life counts. I want to speak to those of you today who maybe you're hesitant to go all in. Maybe your Pastor Dan talked about grabbing one of those serving cards on the table in front of you. You're hesitant to fill out one of those cards. You're hesitant to jump all in. I want to speak to those of you here today that are, that, that are just hesitant to jump in. Those who are watching and restreaming this, like you're laying on the couch at home. I want to speak to you today and let you know that your life counts. Your life counts. You matter. You can make a difference. And not only that, but I would go as far as to say, God needs you. He needs you to make a difference. So we're going to pick up scripture here in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. We're going to read verse 5 through 8 if you've got your Bibles. Here's what it says. It says, the Lord saw how great, man, how great man's wickedness on earth had become. Which, by the way, I think God kind of looks at that today as well. I think he's kind of saying the same thing, like, wow, look at what's going on. In fact, Noah is quoted twice in the New Testament by both Jesus and Peter. And in both places, their context is about the end times. Jesus, in fact, says it this way. Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah. And I think we're living here right now, and I just want you to recognize this, because a lot of people just breeze over the Old Testament and feel like it has nothing to do with us today. It, it does. It has everything to do. So, so let's take a look. At, the Lord saw how great man's wickedness on earth had become. We live here right now, and that every, every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind uh, whom I have created from the face of the earth, men and animals and creatures that move along the ground and birds of the air, for I am grieved that I made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And I think Noah would come along today and I think he would say that a single person can make a difference. You know why? Because he did. A single purpose, a single person can make a difference. The earth was in a horrible condition. God was ready to give up on everyone, but he found one person, a single person who could make a difference. Here's why I want you to hear this today. There's too many churches today that go ahead and they live out their, their church life not thinking this way. There's a lot of people who go to church who they believe, well, I'm not adding to the wickedness of the world, but I'm not doing anything about it either. As long as I'm not adding to it, like if I could, a lot of people, they, they literally show up to church every week out of their personal need. If I can pay my bills, if I can just do my things, if I can work on my house, if I could work on my kids... And the truth is, is that we have this culture, especially in America today, that's just all about me. What can I receive? What can I get from this today? It's just about me. And you need to know that life isn't just about you. I know that's a wake up, it's such a wake up call to the culture that we live in. Because most people, life is just about me. No, life isn't just about you. God sees you and he wants to make a difference through you. 
And so I want you to, I, I just want to show you, and, I, and, and honestly, I, I just hope this message can just really stir you at the same time. Because making a difference, I mean, in a church like this, you can make a vital difference. And I just, I, let, let, let's talk a little bit about how can we make a difference. If you're taking notes, number one, you can make a difference for your family. You can make a difference for your family. Now, family here, family is not necessarily maybe the words that you're thinking. I want us to look at the story of Noah and then dive deeper into this point. Genesis 7, verse 1 says this, it says, The Lord then said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. I want you to notice God didn't say, I found favor with your, with your entire family. No, he, he, said, I, he said, I found favor with you. But because of you, I'm going to let that favor affect your whole family. And there's an important idea here that I don't want you to miss. And you need to understand that when you make a difference, it makes a difference in the people around you. That when you, when you begin to make a true and real difference, that it begins to make a difference with the people who are close to you. And let me just let you in on a little secret. Your life is already affecting the people closest to you right now. Whether you think so or not, you are affecting the people who are closest to you, either in a positive way or negative way. You're all, you're all affecting the people around you. And my job today is to stir you to live your life in a way to where it's affecting the people around you in a positive manner. In fact, let me show you this principle, not just in the Old Testament, but let's look in the New Testament now in Acts chapter 16, verse 31. It says this, it says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. We see this whole family idea again. And so you say, well, well, Pastor Noah, if I pray that prayer, if, if, if I pray that salvation prayer at the end of service, does that mean my entire family is saved? That's not what I'm saying today. No, if you dig into the original language, you really understand the true and full meaning when it says this, you and your household. The original word here for household is the word oikos. It literally means that your household is your sphere of influence. It quite literally means when you read it in context that when you get saved, your salvation should impact your sphere of influence. The people you who are closest to you. So really, it should read, your salvation should impact your sphere of influence. And I want you to know that your salvation is not just about you. A lot of people think that the, I, I talk to a lot of church people, everybody, that, and they say, they say some really off-the-wall odd things. Now, this one might not be so odd, but a lot of people who I talk to when I'm, I'm talking about, hey, let, let, I think it's, let's try to take your next steps. Let's see what God has for you. When I ask them about their salvation, when I ask them about their walk with Jesus, a lot of people's response is, well, my walk with the Lord is just very personal. It's just something, you know, we just keep it be, me and him. And, and, and honestly, that's not consistent with the Bible. Jesus said, let your light shine before others, right? He said, be salt and light, meaning to add to your environment, that we're, we're responsible to add to the places that we go. We're responsible to shine his light. And so that means it's very important for you to be a difference maker. First, in your sphere of influence, everybody. In fact, I was reading this, that uh, there's sociologists actually say that your sphere of influence, the people that you have influence on, you can only have about 12 people in your sphere of influence. I think that's very interesting because Jesus had 12 disciples, of course. And so I think it's cool how science really follows what the Bible says. And they're just kind of catching up to this. I, it, it's, it's so true. And so they figured out that, man, it, they, here's how they calculate your sphere of influence. They say that they take all the people that you spend time with over the week, and anyone you spend an hour or more with a week is in your sphere of influence. What's interesting, and what's also sad, because the next article that I read said this, is that it, it ends up being about 12 to 17 people at the most. And the next article said that the average dad spends about seven minutes of quality time with their kids a day. 
Now you can do the math, seven times seven is 49 minutes a week. That means that for most dads, their own kids are not even in their sphere of influence. So I'm just asking, like, who are you spending your time with? Is your life making a difference in your family? Is your life making a difference in your friends? I'm telling you, Pastor Dan has only a certain amount of influence that he can give. It's your responsibility to go home. Take the responsibility for your family, for your sphere of influence. You will reach people that he and his family could never reach because you have a different sphere of influence, and it's your responsibility. And so would you just accept that responsibility today? Your salvation should impact your sphere of influence. Number two, you can make a difference for your generation, meaning that you have a responsibility for your generation. So I just want to speak to the young people for just a minute. Can I tell you, young, you young person, one of the devil's greatest tricks is to make you think that your life is all about you, that your life is all about what you've got going on. His goal is to get you focused on yourself and how you can enhance your own life, how you can make your life better. And I just want to be clear, God wants you to enjoy your life, of course he does, but that's not what it's all about. If you're going to make a difference in your generation, you have to be different. You have to be different than everyone else. And listen, if we're not careful, it, this even happens to church people. I, I, like I said, church people come up to me all the time, say, Pastor Noah, come on, won't you just preach something just a little bit deeper? You know, like, let, let's just go a little bit. I'd love to just go deeper and, like, let, let's just kind of get off the surface level. And, and that's okay. Like, let, I love deep, everybody. I can go deep with you. That's fantastic. But that's not the purpose of our Sunday morning gathering. My Sunday morning gathering is not, that's not the purpose. In fact, I see this really as a pep talk. I'm supposed to, I, this is a pep talk to send you back out into your world, back out into your sphere of influence so that you can continue to run your race throughout the week. That's what we're here for. So it's not just about knowing more. Knowing more is fantastic. That's great. But instead, we need to remember that it's about making a difference in our generation. In fact, Noah saved his generation. Because of him, he saved a generation of people. Not only that, but let's look at the New Testament where we see about another hero of faith in Acts chapter 13. It writes, it says, For when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. I love that the Bible, when, when, when we talk about David in the New Testament, especially in this verse, I love the, that the Bible doesn't even just say die. Because in the Bible's mind, David didn't really die. He just fell asleep. He just stepped into heaven. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so I love that when you make a difference in your generation, this is, this is the type of impact that you make. Here's number three for you. It's simply this, is that you can make a difference for God. I bring this point, and this is a really simple point, but I bring this to you and I want you to write it down because I just want you to do it, everybody. Like as simple as, simple as it is, I mean, would you just own this point and just begin to do it? Like, God is looking for somebody to enlist. He's looking for someone to, to, to play the play, right, everybody? He, he's, he's, he wants you to make a difference. He's looking for someone to just say, I'll go. I'll do it. And I'm telling you, as a church planner and with, with Dan and this, this church as well, that's, you have to have that attitude. You know what? I'll do it. I'll go. I'll be, I'll be that person. Let's look at what Scripture says, 2 Chronicles 16.9. I love these scriptures. It says, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. Like God is looking right now to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal to him. You know what that verse means? He's, he's looking. He's trying to find some people. He's looking in this room right now. He's asking, will somebody, will somebody play the play? Will somebody make a difference? Will somebody say, I'll go? Ezekiel twenty two thirty. I looked for a man among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so I would not have to destroy it. But guess what? God found no one. He's looking. He's trying to find someone to use in this generation. And I'm telling you that it's harder and harder to find nowadays. He's looking for someone who would just say, you know what? 
I, I, I'm, I'm going to be open-handed, whether that's with your finances, whether that's with your time. I'm willing, I'm going to be open-handed. And guys, I would just love, love, love for him to use us. Like, man, I just, I want God to use the global church to make an impact, to make a difference in the world. And I really do think that if Noah was here today, the character Noah was here today, I think our generation, I think he would, I think he would look at us and I think he would say our generation looks so similar to his and it's so messed up. And I just, I just want you to jump on board. And listen, you can't wait for everyone else to jump on board, but you can. A one person. Would you just decide to be that one person who can make a difference? I got three things super quick for you. And uh, I'll, I, I want to leave you with Noah's, not, these are not my words of encouragement. These are Noah's words, the Noah's words of encouragement. Here's the first one. It's don't be afraid to stand out in a crowd. You say, well, why does that need to be said? Well, chances are God is going to ask you to do something that's going to look pretty foolish. And if he hasn't, get ready, because he will. I, I, I promise you that. He's going to ask you to do something that goes against the flow. In fact, again, with you young people, like to be a difference maker, you really have to be different. In fact, probably the reason so many of us don't make a difference is for the simple fact that we're not different. And the different part is the hard part for us. I mean, can you just imagine Noah in this story? Like, can you imagine it had never rained before, but God said it's going to rain. It never rained before, but God said, build a boat and prepare for it. And so the crowd, we, we see in Scripture that the crowd mocks him. And that was probably okay for the first couple days, right? Even maybe the first week. Like, yeah, God spoke to me, and I'm ready to build this boat. But then, can you imagine, like, it took 120 years to build the boat. Can you imagine, like, year 86? Like, how, how excited do you think Noah was? You're, you're like 86. Like, I, 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 I'm just, I, I want you to see this idea that God is going to ask you to do something maybe kind of out there, kind of wild, something that's never been done before. And don't be afraid to stand out in the crowd when your friends are doing something else, that are, when your friends are just following culture, or doing things that displease God. Don't be afraid to stand out in that way. I'm just asking you today to be a difference maker. And to be a difference maker, you can't follow all the people around you. Proverbs 29, 25, it says this, Fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. Do that very thing. And I'm telling you, it's hard to live righteous in an unrighteous environment. And we're in one today. And I think it's time for us to do the right thing. I think it's time for us to stand up and do things, even when others are not. I think it's our time to stand out in the crowd and to be like Noah. Here's the next thing. Simply this, I think Noah would encourage us by saying this, don't be afraid to do something for the first time. Chances are God's going to ask you to do something very unreasonable and something that you've never done before. God likes to ask you to do things that, I, I think God likes to ask you to do things that you've never done before or that no one else has ever done because I, I think it just really teaches you to trust him more. In fact, to be a difference maker, you're gonna, you cannot be concerned about how foolish it's going to look because he's going to ask you to, to make a way and to carve a way. And I, I'm telling you, just you need to understand this principle. You can't let something that has never been done before prevent you from doing that thing. Hebrews 11.7 says, By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear he built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Can I tell you that some of you, some of you God's been whispering to you, some of you, God has planted a dream and a purpose in your heart. Something that you need to do for the first time. Something that's not been done before. And I don't know what that is for you. I, I, I can't tell you what it is for you. It's not my job. It's the Holy Spirit's job. He's going to lay that on your heart. But I wrote down just a couple examples. And here's really what I just wanted to end with you this morning. Maybe God's speaking to you. Maybe God's just saying, maybe he's just whispering something to you. 
Maybe it's something that just says something like this, like, man, don't quit. Maybe God's whispering and he's saying, it's time to step up. Maybe he's saying, you know what? It's time to take the risk. Maybe God is saying something as simple to you right now. It's just, it's time to apologize. It's time to move on. Maybe God's saying that today is the day. It's time to get some help. Maybe God's saying, well, it's time to get out of that situation. I'm not talking about your marriage, everybody. That's different. Pastor Dan will talk about that later. <laughs> Pastor Noah said it's time to get out. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> no. But, but maybe God's whispering to you and just saying, hey, it's time to slow down. It's time to call that person. Maybe it's something as simple as just start today. Like you can start being a difference maker today. In fact, my favorite part about the Noah story is when the waters recede, God gives a covenant, a sign that we still have today of his promise. In fact, this is the last thing for you to write down. It's simply this. I think Noah would encourage us today that when you see a rainbow, remember that one person a single person, you in this room, you can make a difference. I know that sounds really corny, but it's like God saying, you know what, I promise on the days that you feel alone, I'm with you. I'm still with you. In fact, one of my favorite verses, Matthew 28, 20, it says, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. It's a promise. And I told you earlier in this message that there's two references to Noah in the New Testament. Both Jesus and Peter said that Noah was the perfect picture of what the last days are going to look like. And I just wanted to read this verse to you before we pray. It's found in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 6. We'll read through verse 9. It says this. It says, By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire. So what he's saying here is that at one point, God destroyed the earth with water, but at, at the end of the age, he's going to destroy it with fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish but everyone to come to repentance. And so one day, just as in the days of Noah, God's gonna wipe out this earth. He's gonna take us all home and we'll live with him forever. But the question becomes, why, why, hasn't, why hasn't God come yet? Why, why isn't he here yet? Well, the simple answer, the last verse tells us simply, he's waiting on you because he doesn't want you to perish, but he wants everyone to come to repentance. He's waiting on you to come to know him. And as I close today, Pastor Dan's gonna lead you in a prayer and some next steps on how you can come to know him. But I just wanted to pray a simple prayer over you today. I just wanna call you church to be a difference maker. I know how important it is in a church plant and I just am encouraging you, would you just be, commit to being a difference maker? God can do some amazing things in your life when you just make that simple decision today. So would you close your eyes, bow your heads. Can I just pray a prayer of blessing over you? Father, today, we thank you. Father, thank you for giving us this story. Father, thank you for giving us this example that we can see through the life of Noah. That God, we are called to be a difference maker. Lord, that a single person in this room can make a difference. So Father, help us to accept that responsibility. Lord, help us to accept the responsibility in our family and our friends and our sphere of influence with our loved ones. And Lord, help us to know that we're needed, that not all the places are already filled. Know that we're needed right here, even as simple as it is just right here in this house, Lord, in this church, that we are called to make a difference through this local church. Father, I pray for every person in this room who's just on the edge. 
Father, for that person who is, who, who is ready, who, who, who is just getting ready to serve, God, would you give them the faith, the ability, the strength, whatever it is, to have that conversation, to write it down on that card, whatever it is, Lord, would you speak to your people right now? Father, we're here, we're open-handed, Lord, we're listening to you. And God, we just invite you to speak. Holy Spirit, speak to our hearts right now in this moment. Lord, we love you. We thank you for these things. We pray all these things in your name.